The subject I have been assigned is a topic that you are familiar with since you work in cellars, in wineries. I talk about stabilization techniques. They differ, and every winery, every winemaker has different objectives. But the techniques in this case are linked to the topic of a low environmental impact, which we have been focusing on for some time now. Here, you see a brief statement that I took from the Stabby Wine project. They asked a question, and I'm only going to mention this briefly, uh, back in 2015. They asked consumers and buyers what reasons guided them when choosing between two wines of equal price and quality, they asked whether their choice was influenced by certain factors. The preferred factors were reduction in energy and water consumption. The European Stabby Wine project then led to the development of a new molecule called polyaspartate, which enologists have known for a few years now. But we continue to work at it because some interesting things have emerged, and this is the subject of my contribution. Let's start with the fact that um, the OIV resolution back in 2008 stated what was essentially said by the previous speakers. It speaks about global strategies, the need to focus on the environment, uh, viticulture, safety, health, product safety and consumer health and enhancement in general. When I read this summary by the OIV, I thought that's a really good thought. It's not easy to achieve it, but we have to go in this direction. My approach, which is what I have found at EVA since I started working there, and it has been 20 years now, is that we should try to interpret what the winery really needs, because each of us has different needs, and I really believe in a customized solution. At EVA, I have found a good inclination for dynamism. If we apply this to sustainability, it really is useful not to use standard recipes, but to try all of us to make every effort to enhance the quality of wine making. And I would also add healthy wine, because this is another very important issue today. Therefore, we should strive for the correct choice of products in the right doses, no more and no less, because in the end we have to provide safety. Together, we can also evaluate protocols for using products correctly, measuring their effectiveness, working safely, and simplifying work in the cellar as much as possible. This is our aim. I'm going to comment on this quickly. In bold letters, I have written what we will try to then examine in detail. The Stabby Wine Project talks about polyaspartate, and I will explain how we interpreted it at EVA. Then there are a whole series of other pos possible actions that we can perform in the winery. The last one at the end, at the bottom, which I hope will also capture your interest, is a new technique. It is the technique of continuous phenolic stabilization. I imagine that these contributions, these presentations will be shared later, and I remain at your disposal to go into all these points in more detail if you wish to do so.
Quindi ho sfruttato questo... So I make reference to the Stambi Wine report in relation to polyaspartate, which has been uh, approved in enology. Actually, it has been created for the production of organic wines as well, where it has not been allowed yet, though, but the application for approval of its use has been in progress since 2015. The interesting thing about this project is that it measures, as was said in the first presentation, the effects of the winery techniques we know. This is the thing that intrigued me in preparing this presentation because I too had to make a number of evaluations and I hope to be able to give you uh, interesting and useful information now. When comparing the various practices, I have taken out what is referred to in the project as called stabilization or for refrigeration because you all know it. It is certainly the most widespread technique in the cellar, but it has proved to be the one that unfortunately has the highest energy consumption. It involves the use of crystallizers and it also entails, unfortunately, a loss in quality because we lose colloids, we lose color and the quality can deteriorate due to the enrichment of oxygen, which potentially means oxidation. Stambi Wine then points out that it is a costly investment. Uh, you see, chilling systems use refrigerating gases, so we will see later on that the advice is given to at least choose those with a lower environmental impact. There is then another technique that I personally know little about, but I have always heard about it with interest, especially in large wineries. Electrodialysis. It gives large wineries, which have a large technical and competent structure, the possibility of achieving the exact stability value they want. But this requires expertise and, and it entails high costs, which decrease as the amount of wine treated increases. So large wineries that produce large volumes can easily use electrodialysis. But Stambi Wine has shown that there is a high consumption of water, especially energy, but also water. We will see that it is the technique that consumes more water, which leads in, in turn to a high production of effluent. For those who have the wastewater management system, it is fine. It is not allowed for organic winemaking, which we are relatively concerned about because most wine is conventional, but the main problem is energy uh, consumption. Iron exchange resins. Uh, I wrote Stabtar uh, here uh, as uh, an example, and I added photos because it is a technique that we know very well at Ever. It was um, found by this project to be cheaper and easy to, to use. You know that in Italy there are also companies that rent these systems. It is particularly interesting for wines with a low acidity. But, as you know, this technique, which was proposed in the first resolution for achieving tartaric stability, is actually used either in synergy or, above all, to reduce pH. The pH increase in wines around the world is a, is a real problem. So today, ion exchange resins and Therefore, our Stabtar systems are extensively used for pH management purposes. It must also be said that in the past, some of these resins had a negative effect on the sensory profile. Based 
on our analysis and evaluations, we can now say that they are also used in wineries where also high quality wines are produced. So the sensory aspect, in my opinion, is less problematic, meaning that we know that we can count on their use not only for table wines, but also for high end wines. These systems consume energy and water, but they have a lower energy consumption than other systems. We will see later a summary table about this. What actually limits the use of this equipment, uh, of this technique, is in those regions, and I'm thinking of northern countries, such as Germany, where they have uh, wines that are already very acidic with a low pH, so there the limit becomes evident. Furthermore, this technique is not authorized in the organic wine making sector. We Let's now talk about additives. We all know about metatartaric acid. It is the cheapest and easy, and it is a very easy pro to use product. As a disadvantage, we know that for wines that have a short shelf life, everything is fine, but when we have wines that have to last for a long time, things get more complicated. Then, as a previous speaker said, the problem is that sometimes we ship wines around the world, perhaps in containers that are not adequately insulated, and so the wine gets hot, and you know that when it gets hot, metatartaric acid hydrolyzes and is transformed back into tartaric acid, and this is an additional complication, of course. Together with metatartaric acid, uh, winemakers have learned about the characteristics of a cellulose GAM, as the French call it, that is to say carboxymethylcellulose, CMC, which is also uh, cheap. I believe that we all use it by now in its uh, liquid form. We do not find any negative effects on quality, therefore neither positive nor negative effects, but unfortunately it does not have the same effectiveness that we were used to with metatartaric acid and that we have found in polyaspartate. In addition, it has been banned in red wine, so that in the cellars you have one stabilizer for white wines and a different one for red wines. When we happen to have wines that are young and we are asked to immediately bottle a product that is not stable yet from a colloidal point of view, CMC might also become clogging. Then there is an aspect that we enologists do not evaluate very much perhaps, but which was highlighted by a previous speaker as important, and that is the environmental impact, which becomes significant because we are handling large volumes of liquid solutions. In the Stabby Wine project, they also said that it has not been authorized yet for the organic sector. Manoproteins. We all agree that they are wonderful products. We have been convinced of this for many years. Uh, even since we have also embraced the experience of Intec. We know that manoproteins can also um, impact on the quality of wine at an organoleptic level, so much so that at the beginning, at least in our experience, we looked more at the sensory effect rather than the stabilizing effect. Others have focused on it more as a stabilizer. However, the problem with this additive is that it is ineffective in highly unstable wines. And going back to the potassium issue mentioned by a previous speaker, I can say that we have seen wines, uh, and we did so in recent years, where the potassium was really high. So it is interesting to find solutions, even in particularly difficult conditions. There is also another issue. We normally do not want to talk about costs, but you ask us to do so. Manoproteins are unfortunately a more expensive product. Luckily, 
it was authorized in organic farming in 2019 when um, the stubby wine project was done it was not authorized not yet gamma arabic is a low cost product easy to use and when i read that it had been judged to have a positive or absent effect i said to myself that among our gums i cannot find one that does not have a positive effect on quality we also know that it has been authorized in organic winemaking but many studies indicate that the effect may improve stability. It must be said that gums are not all the same. They are uh, dextro-rotary and levorotary. So let's say that it can help, but it is not the stabilizer par excellence. So here we come to the subject of polyaspartate. Stabby wine has judged it to be low cost. Some of you probably will disagree, but I hope to make you change your mind when we evaluate the final table. It is easy to use, also because it is very easy to solubilize. It has no effect on quality, either positive or negative. Uh, as, a, as a molecule, at least the one selected by the Stabby Wine project. And, as I said at the beginning, it is authorized in conventional winemaking and we are waiting for an answer for organic wines. But the authorization process has been going on for five years now, so it will be settled soon, also because it is much awaited by organic producers. Actually, they started this whole thing. We said, and you all know it, that all those who propose polyaspartate claim that it is especially effective even in highly unstable wines. For me, highly unstable means that we have managed, and we will see examples later on, to achieve stability even with drops in conductivity close to or above 500 uh, microsiemens. At first, it was compared to metatartaric acid. At the highest dosage of metatartaric, a similar action on stability has been seen, on tartaric stability. But with polyaspartate, then in 2015, stability tests were carried out for at least two years. So today we can certainly say more. The great thing is that different types of polyaspartate have been tested, differing in molecular weight, differing in production method, differing in the type of cation used for neutralization. Out of all of them, the winner was KPA 15KD, which you can also find identified in the OIV resolution. Therefore, the Chinese polyaspartate that will also reach our market in the future will probably not have these characteristics. And these make the difference. We take this type into consideration. With this polyaspartate, we have seen that there are no interactions with the color, and as is the case with the CMC, there may be an interaction with the stable colloids in the wine, but we have also seen that some of these problems can be solved by adding gam arabic. We can discuss about this, but anyway, the important thing is that, as with metatartaric acid and CMC, there is an interaction with proteins, so we must do the treatment when the wines have reached protein stability. I'm opening a parenthesis here, because what I uh, have said, I, I, I do not do, actually, because I also like to open up new avenues, and one of them is to add our product, for example, at the first racking off, before cooling the wines, perhaps, if we want to avoid malolactic fermentation. We have done it and we have been doing it for years to counteract the loss of acidity. It is clear that if I have a wine like Gewurz Tramina with a very high quantity of proteins, it is clear that I will lose part of the product, but some winemakers have convinced me to pursue this path because they say that they are probably willing to spend more money for that kind of quality and avoid perhaps an excessive use of bentonite. 
In addition, there are no negative effects on filterability, and this is also very important because it means higher yields in microfiltration. Another interesting thing that I read was that in the Stabby Wine project, they wanted to assess possible organoleptic variations. They have dosed up to three times the maximum legal dosage without finding organoleptic variations. This is an interesting thing from my point of view. We all have our own sensitivity, and I say this because uh, it happened to me to perceive differences. I remember in some red wines, but then when I tried to demonstrate this by doing uh, a dual uh, cryo test, I had to admit that under objective conditions, I was not able to prove the difference. I have therefore convinced myself that the product is sensory neutral. We have already said that since polyaspartate interacts with proteins, uh, it would be good, especially for pre-bottling, to use it on practically stable wines in terms of proteins. The color note is there because there is this colloidal interaction, and we will see how we have resolved it at ever. Companies that can carry out tests to assess tartaric instability find it extremely easy to carry out efficacy evaluations. We will see examples later to identify the correct dosage. And here I underline this because while we initially always proposed the maximum dosage, after years of experience, we can say that our philosophy is to try to identify the correct dosage for safety, knowing that, as we will show in the example and see in the examples, this product works over time. What's more, since polyaspartate is a product that generates a solution with low viscosity, we have seen that we can dissolve it in, in cold water. We also sell a 10% polyaspartate solution, which is ready to use. But in order to pay attention to sustainability, our solution has been that of microgranulated formulations, which we will see later. We dissolve it directly into the wine, and as we would do with metatataric acid, uh, CMC, gum, or manoproteins, all we have to do is stir, stir it, and it creates a product which, thanks to its low viscosity, homogenizes very quickly. Here I would like to speed up a bit so that I have more time for questions later, if any. Considering the OIV uh, guidelines, which urge us to limit all inputs that enter the winery, but also already in the vineyard, that is plant protection products, soil amendments, etc. But above all, as far as polyaspartate is concerned, uh, we should limit water and energy consumption and try to um, consume what is absolutely necessary to obtain what is needed. In order to meet these requirements in terms of tataric stability, Stubby One states that polyaspartate, which is obtained from a renewable source and through a bioprocess, is the additive for tataric stabilization that most closely meets the objectives set out in the OIV guidelines. With regard to the consumption of water and energy, it is stressed that consumption must be reduced and reference is even made to attention to hygiene. I would like to stress here that in many wineries, hygiene is exceptional, excellent, and we have even surpassed the food industry levels. But there are wineries where progress needs to be made. Attention is paid here to hygiene, and we will see why this is not an issue in the case of polyaspartate. 
Attention is also paid to the noise made by the equipment, environmental pollution, and there is an emphasis on refrigerants, which, as we have said, must be chosen out of those that pollute the atmosphere the least. As far as water consumption, effluents and discharges are concerned, the definition says that KPA does not produce produce a solid waste and does not produce liquid waste either, because we can put it directly into the wine. Electrodialysis in particular, but also resins, consume more water. We know this. It will be up to the uh, technicians to choose when and why to use what. But in the meantime, we know that uh, and certainly many have found themselves in the position of receiving an order for a product and having to stabilize it in a short time. Well, here we have the possibility of using a stabilizer that acts immediately and does not cause any water or energy consumption. I will skip this part, uh, partly at least because of the time uh, constraints. The OIV rightly uh, states uh, that uh, from grape processing to packaging, we must make every possible effort and even use products that are perhaps reusable, uh, which is why I like the idea I mentioned at the beginning of uh, continuous polyphenol stabilization. We do not have time today to talk about this, but we will address it uh, later on. We have said that polyaspartate, in addition to having a high stabilizing effect, avoids the use of traditional tartaric stabilization and does not cause hygiene problems. Many of the products we use, I'm thinking of gelatin, for example. I dissolve gelatin in water and ask you, how many of you have had problems with strange odors because the winemaker forgot to sanitize? The advantage of a product of this kind of polyaspartate is that it is dissolved directly into the wine, so it does not contribute to any kind of contamination at a microbiological level. This is perhaps a small thing, but a, or obvious thing, but I thought it would be useful to point it out. In addition, Stubby Wine says, be careful, large wineries which use the cold stabilization method can even recover all the lees and all the tartrates for the recovery of the tartaric acid and its salts, but it can happen that other wineries, perhaps small or medium-sized, discharge this material and actually uh, pollute. And today we want to control this at all costs. When it comes to using electrodialysis in particular, but also resins, we have effluents that are enriched with potassium, and therefore we have to dispose of them with particular care. In essence, here are two comparisons between the CO2 emissions of polyaspartate and those of um, called stabilization. In the box, you can see that we are um, at over 3,000 kilos of CO2 per ton of polyaspartate. I have divided them by 1,000 to arrive to 3 uh, kilos per kilo of polyaspartate. And if I look at the maximum dosage of 10 grams per hectoliter, I have to compare that uh, uh, 0.031 to 1.39 of cold tartaric stabilization. The number is more than 40 times uh, higher in the case of cold stabilization or lower in the case of polyaspartate. Moreover, Stabiwine says that the production of uh, CO2 that is obtained with polyaspartate is essentially due to the production of L-aspartic acid, which is a natural amino acid present in wine necessary for the production of this polymer. It is the monomer from which the polymer is created. While 
66% uh, of refrigeration, that 1.39 kilo, is due to energy consumption. Uh, these are the differences. This is a final table. From the colors at the bottom, you can see the total cost. With one of your colleagues uh, from um, Romania, I discussed the other day the cost uh, difference uh, between cold stabilization and polyaspartate. Look at the first column on the left and the last column on the right. We uh, see that cold uh, stabilization is more than 10 times higher in terms of cost. Which one is the cheapest? We know that it is metatataric acid, but we also know its limits, so I will not comment further on this. Water consumption. We see that we have a higher water consumption where we use electrodialysis and we have higher greenhouse gas emissions when we use cold stabilization. This is just to make a conclusive assessment of these techniques. You have probably already seen data of this type. These are the official data from the Stambi Wine project. The solutions that ever wanted to adopt in compliance with the OIV guidelines are two formulations, both microfiltrable, where together with that type of polyaspartate, KPAA5KD, there are polysaccharides and monoproteins. What is the advantage? With only 25 grams per hectoliter, which is the maximum dosage, we are able to stabilize highly unstable wines. And when we use Stabilissima app, we are able to have a synergy and obtain color stability and thanks to the presence of polysaccharides and manoproteins, we are also able to improve what we have uh, defined as the organoleptic expression. The interesting thing is that if the OIV tells us to pay attention to the environmental impact, a microgranulated product that is immediately soluble in wine means that we will obviously consume less water. Let's start from this, from water. I told you that the product we use is controlled to be microfiltrable. These are the things that are more useful to the winemaker. Speeding up, uh, obtaining immediate stability, not having SO2 variations, which I think today is another uh, question mark and other issue for consumers. The other interesting thing is that the microgranulated product has a longer shelf life. It is a more stable product, I mean as an additive, and remains more stable over the course of time in the cellar. It's not that you buy it to keep it in, in the cellar, but very often when there is a liquid product, one wonders how long it lasts. Is it still good after one year? The other thing is the packaging. We made a polyethylene packaging, and so that uh, here we have this ratio, 30 grams of the back for five kilos instead of more than one kilo of a jerry can. Since we are also discussing about the consumption of plastic and about pollution that we want to reduce, this could be a further consideration which is worth making. I would add, that we are perhaps not so much interested in listening to you if you talk to me, because you see, I may be the one asking uh, questions. But jokes aside, the idea here is to provide real technical support to help those who uh, need to choose the dose to find the optimum one in relation to costs too. To, and the fact of using the product in the best way possible, and therefore have a guaranteed effectiveness of stability. Let's now see a few examples. I would like to thank my colleague from uh, Romagna, Bruno Ranieri, from the winery in Forlì, who gave me a Sangiovese San 2020. He compared 
out of interest uh, traditional refrigeration at minus four for seven days. And we in the winery had carried out an evaluation with half the dose of Stabilissima up. We saw that many wines were stable, but the most stable one was the one with 20 grams of Stabilissima up. At that time, I did not know that Sangiovese, Bruno's Sangiovese, was also stable in color. Bruno also wanted to insist and see what the lowest dosage was. In Romagna, you have well-equipped cellars, and he discovered that already 12.5 grams, so that is one-third of the maximum dosage that can be used, was sufficient to give the product stability, even slightly better than uh, uh, cold stabilization. The graph on the right is divided into four bands, as you know. In the yellow band, the lowest curve is that of refrigeration. The middle one corresponds to the lowest dosage of Stabilissima up, the highest one in purple. The shortest is the one with the maximum dosage of Stabilissima up. The maximum dosage is 20 grams, which is half of what we can use, or what we might use. What we have seen as an advantage in an open exchange of opinions uh, with uh, Bruno, as is normally the case in Romagna, is this. Cost stabilization made him lose 12.5% of the coloring uh, intensity and made him lose half a gram of tartaric acid, which is more than 25%. So, in one case, I do a regeneration wait a week, use PAMS and so on, while in the other case I had the product get stability and keep the color and keep the acidity. In addition, I asked uh, Bruno for uh, an organoleptic evaluation. I made one myself, but that was done in Pramagiore and it is different. Each of us, each of you working in wineries, we all have a different organoleptic sensitivity because we we know what to do for our end customer. Bruno told me that on an olfactory level, he perceived it finer while in the mouth it was softer. And this is the reason why when we thought about Stabilissima app, we thought of pre-bottling products and of the fact that that could give something more already than just tartaric stability. I'm about to conclude. This is a, a big uh, uh, producer. I have deleted the names because I didn't ask them for permission to show their data. But it is a big producer uh, of Prosecco Rosé. We are working at Prosecco Rosé. I'm not, I'm not saying we are beginners, but there is a lot to discover also because they have chosen a grape variety, Pinot Noir, which is not so easy to manage in terms of color stability. In this case, what uh, is interesting is that it is a wine with a very strong tartaric instability. Here I'm telling you uh, from memory, the drop in conductivity was uh, 277 microsiemens. We did a test directly in the Prise de Mousse. We did three dosages using Stabilissima S, where the maximum dosage is 25. We started with uh, 20, then 15, then 10. So let's say that all three curves allow us to say that we have reached the stability zone. In this case, however, for the sake of honesty, we must take into account the fact that during the prise de mousse, we also have protein production. So we could have an interaction and therefore perhaps a loss of effectiveness. However, and this is what I can say that we proved, we also have the margin to return to stability, to deliver a product which is ready for bottling without problems with the filters. And we have largely improved the operational management of the winery safeguarding the thing that they were interested in, which is acidity. Since I was told by another important producer of spumante that, by law, it is not possible to correct the acidity when the spumante is finished, we asked ourselves, why not? Why not 
safeguard the acidity from the beginning of the prise de mousse, then we can also do it afterwards, but each winemaker can make their choice. I think that this is the last slide. We have uh, published it on the website because a curious winemaker asked me a question that I was unable to answer. The question was, if I have put Stabilissima into a wine to prevent acidity, we have a 2,000 or 5,000 hectoliter tank of Trebbiano. We have used Stabilissima. Then I realize that I have to lower the pH. If I do this on the resins, what happens? And I answered, I don't know, we have to do a test. And so we did a test. This is a really highly unstable wine, 520, 540 micro Siemens with a Stabilissima S at the maximum dosage. We arrived at approximately 40 micro Siemens. We saw, um, and what happened? And the answer is yes, you can even think about using Stabilissima first and then uh, Stapter, but also the other way around. What I can tell you without going into details, because I would need more time and I do not want to confuse you and give you a headache late at night, but basically I can tell you that we have seen that the resins, at least with our Stapter, do not retain Stabilissima, so we can imagine a synergy. I use Stabilissima and I have to manage my pH or vice versa. I have lowered the pH and then I add Stabilissima. We have treated a wine with 25% um, added the resins after treating with Stabilissima and you can see that with a little amount of Stabilissima in a wine treated with the resins, we obtain a high level of stability, taking into account where we started from over 500 micro Siemens, and we have gone down to around 70, 80 micro Siemens. We are not making miracles yet, but we are trying hard. Pierluigi, I think I have finished with this slide. I, I apologize for telling so many things in a short time, but I have tried to give you uh, my point of view uh, about these things, and uh, I hope it was interesting. Thank you very much for your attention.